Welcome to Christ the King Church, Shelby, North Carolina's Healing Center. Hi, I'm Melinda, Pastor Moore's starter. Welcome to our broadcast. Relax and enjoy our teaching. You know, whenever we're going through something, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today is, I want you to look at the person beside of you and just tell them, today might be your day. The day might be your day. Just think about that. Jesus can change your life to the point to where you don't look like the same person. Jesus can change your life to where people get confused about it. Is that really Roger? Is that the same Roger I know? That's the kind of Holy Spirit encounter I'm talking about. In the Old Covenant, you know, when God would, somebody would have an encounter with God, they would change their name. You know, Saul had his name changed from Saul to Paul. And he went on to preach. But even all of his preaching and writing, all these words he wrote for the Bible, even toward the end, he, he went through hardships. He went through trials. But even in the end, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. He had seen people's lives change completely. He seen himself going from killing Christians to actually trying to preach to them. And at first, they didn't know how to take that because they thought he was a trick. But he was changed so drastically that he went on to write a large portion of the New Testament. But not only that, miracles, shipwrecks, prison, he was beaten, he was in prison. He, it, it wasn't all, it wasn't all what, what you say, clouds and happiness for Paul, I'm sure. He suffered hardships as he was going through that. But he knew who had called him and he knew what his purpose was. And even when he was going to Jerusalem to give his life, he knew that he wasn't going to survive that. He knew what was going to happen when he was a Roman citizen and he knew when he told them what he was going to tell them what was going to happen. He said, I'm constrained that I must go. See, that's, that's the difference between a disciple and a believer. You know, Pastor Vern's been talking about discipleship and that's the difference between a true disciple and a true, just, a, just a novice believer. A true disciple might see something bad coming, but he knows he can't, he can't you know, you just can't, you can't miss it because it's coming. But anyway, we're going to keep this as positive as we can. You know, and as uh, I was saying, you know, in, in September we sold our house and we moved to Gaffney and we've been working on remodeling a house for a long time there. And, you know, I hurt my back. If you've ever had back pain, you know what I'm talking about. I hurt my back, and, you know, I got to the point when I had hurt my back, I got to the point at one time there I couldn't put my own socks and shoes on. For a young man, that's very, very, very humbling to have to let your wife help you get dressed in the morning and trying to work and trying to go on. And, but I'm going to tell you something. I thought I was a pretty mature Christian, but pain, I'm telling you something, pain will make you question a lot of things. Pain will take you to a point in your life you didn't think you'd ever be there. I was there. I got to a point in my life to where I was hurting so bad that I was saying, God, have I missed you? God, am I not in your will? God, did, we, did I do something wrong? Mm, I'm going to tell y'all. I heard a voice from heaven one night. Hallelujah. It sounded like the radio turned on. It sounded like I was listening to it off a of radio and there wasn't nobody there but me. And I really heard the voice of the Lord say, you got hurt. And it's going to take time to get over it. Now, to y'all, that might not mean nothing. But when you're questioning your faith, God, what am I doing wrong? Sometimes we just get hurt. Sometimes we just do something stupid we shouldn't do. And it takes us a few months to get over it. Now, you know, Beverly's the type of person that, you know, she prays for a while. Then she sort of gets angry for a while. And then she sort of gets... And I'm like, baby, just relax, honey, relax. I'm going to get over this. I know, I know I'm going to get over this. And, uh, you know, but pain will make you take your focus off of him and put your focus on that pain. And once you start focusing on that pain, you can try to dull that pain with painkillers. You can try to dull that pain with whatever. But I'm telling you, there's a point in everybody's life you're going to come up against a Goliath. And I think I, I think I came up against my Goliath. I pray I never reach anything like that again. But I got down to the point before I heard that voice from the Lord, the only thing I could say was, Jesus, Jesus. I got to the point where I couldn't pray. I got to the point where I was hurting so bad, and I felt like I was wasting my time praying. Now, does that sound like a mature Christian? No. But if you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. And I, I got to where I was just saying, Jesus. 
Jesus, just touch me, Lord. Lord, just let me get over this, Lord. Jesus, just touch me. And you know, and it took time, and like I say, after I got that voice from him, you know, then I got to looking at things just a little different. But let's, let's turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. Now therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention to you in my prayers. Listen now, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. How many of you here know we need wisdom and revelation? Sometimes you need a fresh word from the Lord. The manna that you got last year is not no good today. It's gone and bad. You need a fresh word that day. But right here now, all right, tell your neighbor next to you, today might be your day. Today might be your day. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. How many of you know this world today needs the eyes open to see? See. And you know, that the eyes would be open. Now listen, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of the power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. So see, that's who we've got to get our, we have to have our focus on, on him, on Jesus. But it's not because he's just up there, but especially when you're going through things in your life where... You know, we always want to know why. We always want to know why. You know, I guess that's just human nature. Let's turn to John chapter 9. And uh, John chapter 9, this is a story of a man born blind who received his sight. All right, John chapter 9, verse 1. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it the man, or was it his parents, that he was born blind? See, they thought that somebody had sinned and caused this blindness to come on him. And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, that, when, that night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But think about this. He, and we're not going to read this whole chapter for sake of time, but here was a guy blind from birth, but Jesus saw him. And everybody was trying to figure out, now why is this guy blind? Now see, sometimes things happen in people's lives. Sometimes we bring stuff on ourselves. Sometimes things just happen to good people. I don't know if y'all realize it or not, but when it got cold this week with all this record cold, it was on all of us. And next week, we're going to have record heat. and We're all going to be affected by that. And see, that's the way troubles are in this flesh on earth sometimes. Sometimes just bad things happen. But when things do happen and God does heal, we need to give Him the glory. Amen. The glory be unto Him. If, if these elders around here lay their hands on me and I... And I get healed, which I got prayed for several times while I was going through this. Got anointed with oil, got prayed for. It wasn't instantaneous. I, did, I didn't just feel it all of a sudden it was gone. But like, I did get prayed for. But guess what? I didn't give these men no glory for laying hands on me. I didn't give these men no glory. I didn't give the oil no glory. It's the healing came from God. I give God the glory. It's so good to see Billy Butler here this morning. We... Last week, we stood there and held hands and we prayed for Billy Butler that he'd be able to attend the church this week. I'm so glad to see you here this morning, Bill, because he said they took him off his medicine, now he's better. So there we go. So maybe that's, a, you know, some cases, maybe that's the case. But it's so good to see him here. But you know, when this guy was healed, we're going to jump down a little bit. Uh, and in verse 13, they brought him who was formerly as formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again, Now how he had received his sight. He said to them, 
He put clay on my eyes. I washed, and now I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this is not the, this is not, this man is not from God because he does not keep the seventh. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And they were as divided among themselves. When they said to the blind man again, what do you have to say about him because he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. But if you think about what was going on here, you would have thought, if somebody got healed of blindness from birth, you would have thought they'd have put him a special place in their meetings. You know, we want to learn about this Jesus that healed you. We want to learn about this God who has the power to touch. What did they do? They excommunicated him from the church. They said, well, there's no way in the world you can stay a part of our thing. They kicked him plumb out of the church. But you think about that. They excommunicated the healed man because God had touched him. And what's so sad about that today don't get, so, don't get so upset when you tell the people that you go to work with or people you might see outside of church, well, we believe in a church that still believes in healing today. You get some weird looks. You mean God can still heal? Yeah, God can still heal. There's some people around here that God has healed. There's some people around here who have recovered from cancer and who have recovered from other things. And there's some people around here God gave them wisdom about their diet and they got off of diabetes medicine. So, I mean, not everything is a disease that can't be controlled when we have a little input on it. You know, my doctor told me about the year 2000, he said, your mama's an insulin diabetic, your dad's an insulin diabetic, both your grandparents are insulin diabetic. If you don't quit drinking sodas, you're going to be a diabetic. Now, I can take that knowledge from a medical doctor and I can say, well, you're crazy. I'm going to continue drinking in my Mountain Dews. No, I went home and I said, you know what, I'm going to give this sugar up. I mean, that's, that's been 18 years ago. Last time I had it checked, my sugar was perfect. But my point is, God gives us wisdom and regulation, revelation of how to live our life, even in stuff like that. And, you know, and people talk about, people talk about, well, you know, I believe once you bless it, everything's good. Well, okay, believe that. Take that, take that right with you. I don't have no problem with that either. I don't have no problem agreeing with anybody in this church that's agreeing for God to touch him in anything. I have no problem whatsoever agreeing. If you want to believe God that you can eat anything you want and you're going to be good, I'll agree with you on that. And I pray that that's the way it'll work out. But I listen to what the doctor said and I give up sodas and I give up sweet tea and I give up all that sugar I was taking in. Now, do I still have grounds to improve? Sure, we all do. But, you know, you've got to have wisdom and you've got to have revelation working in your life. But the thing about it, when you get to that time, when you get to that time in your life where you're even having trouble praying, it's important that you're connected to, if you've got a spouse that prays, but be connected to a church that prays. You know, everybody says, well, there ain't no use going to church today. That's a bunch of hypocrites. Well, if you got that attitude toward church, they probably not know you should come into church. Because it ain't a bunch of hypocrites. It's a bunch of flesh, normal people trying to live for God. We're all flesh. We're all human. None of us are perfected. And you know, and the God never told us one place in this Bible that I know of that he tells us to love, not to judge. So, I mean, you know, I try not to judge people. I try not to. And it's hard because, you know, it's human nature to ask why. And it's human nature to try to figure out. And it's human nature to really judge people really I don't know if you ain't careful you get caught up in that but see Jesus I had somebody tell me this and it, it kind of set on me for a little bit there but uh, she said you know she said the number one cause of mental illness in America today is bad religion I said well, wait a minute the number one cause of mental illness is bad religion she said that's true she said in, 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 in the mental you know in treating people for mental illness said a lot of times they get into the wrong religion they get into the wrong way of thinking and it has effect on their life where man they lose touch with reality man i said bad religion i don't i said i don't I, you know i, I deal with that a little i kicked that around in my head a little bit but you know it's important who you listen to it's important what voices you listen to it's important what you listen to when it comes to a man of faith that's standing up preaching to you you know if it don't line up with the scripture you probably need to set that aside to start with. But you know, a true, a true person who has really studied the Bible, I heard somebody say this a long time ago, and I believe it too. You've got to search out for your own self, your salvation in fear and trembling. 
you know, Pastor Vern, I love him. I've been with him since I was a kid. I've been with him, believe, and, I, and I, you know, I believe what he preaches up here, and I believe he's a man of God. But, you know, the Bible says if anybody comes to you preaching anything other than the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you need to, you need to get away from him, you know, even if it's an angel of light, because knowing him and the power of his resurrection, because at some point we're going to need... We're going to need that power to re resurrect our body. We're going to need that power to move us on to the other side. So I believe you really do have to believe in that. But as I was, th as I was thinking about this, you know, there's so much today that tries to get our focus on something other than Jesus. There's so much today, whether it be social media, whether it be Facebook, whether it be TV, whether it be politics, whether it be whatever. Everything out there we have around is always an influence that's trying to get our focus on something other than God. Now, Jesus said, I didn't say this, this is letters in red in John chapter 8, verse, I just ain't on my list, but, uh, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, that's John 8, 31 and 32. Now listen, I didn't say that. It's, it's written in red. Jesus said that. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, I tell you what, we need to be free. Amen? And I tell you, we don't need to be in bondage to thinking that you've got to live your life in a certain way. You've got to pray a certain way. You've got to walk a certain way. You've got to wear a certain kind of clothes. You've got to keep a certain haircut. There's still a lot of religions around today that preach that, you know. Uh, you know, I grew up in church, and uh, I know everybody here probably did, but me and Beverly attended a church where it's wrong to wear pants. They give her the up and down about having pants on. And I say, with everything going on in the world today, why is that something you would get hung on? You know, that uh, women shouldn't wear pants. And I mean, you know, uh, but like you say, that's just different people take the Scripture and they try to use the Scripture to control people. Now, what I'm saying today, I'm not saying anything up here that I hope that you would think that I was trying to control you, but I will tell you this, today may be the day that God can change things in your life. I really do believe the way we live our life, the way we practice our faith, has an has a ongoing process of becoming mature Christians, has an effect on how you live your life. If you live your life in a certain way six months from now, You'll either be more spiritual, you'll either be more mature, or you'll either be going the other way, one or the other. You see so many people getting away from God. So many people say, well, I don't go to church no more. I, I, I've tried this church, this church, this church, this church. Well, I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the power of His resurrection working in your life to the point to where people see you that hadn't seen you in six months, and they say, Pete, is that you? Well, you preaching something, boy. You know, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Now, uh, Pastor Sam was preaching here the other week about the road to Emmaus, the two disciples that left. And I know we got stopped sort of in the middle, but I seen where you were headed with that. But they were backslid. Those two, those two Jesus told them specifically, stay in Jerusalem until I endure you with power on high. Well, they said after all happened to Jesus, they just said, we're going home. To me, that's backslid. He ain't doing what Jesus told him to do. But even when we don't do exactly what Jesus tells us to do, He intervenes in our life. He intervened in their life. And what happened to them whenever they met Jesus on the road? It says they turned around and went back to Jerusalem. So they, He got them turned around. So even when maybe you are hurting to the point to where you can't hardly come to church and people don't understand that you're hurting so bad that I, I, I just can't go. I just can't get up. When you're hurting like that or whenever you're going through, Jesus will turn things around for you. You just keep trusting in Him. He will turn things around for you, I promise. And you know, a lot of people walk after the flesh. And if you think about that, if you have your focus on this flesh and you get over 50, you've got some issues, I guarantee you. I, I've got some after 50 that I didn't have before 50. My daddy used to tell me, my dad passed away at 62, and I still don't, to this day don't understand that because he had so much life. But he told me, he said, Dwayne, you whining around at 30. He said, just wait till you get to 60. I said, oh, when I get to 60, I'm going to be good, Daddy. I'm going to be, be. He said, you just trust me. Just trust me. You know, there's a difference. But we can't focus on this flesh. We have to focus on him. 
And we don't, have, we don't focus just on this church. Now, I know this survey you turned out. I think that's a great thing, getting input, getting information. But unless the Holy Spirit comes in here, invades people's life, changes people's life, we all got opinions on what we could do around here to make it better. And I think we could make things better. But how many of you know how many opinions we have? It's more than elbows. You know, we all have opinions. We all have. But until the Holy Spirit starts touching people and changing people's life, that's what's going to turn things around. That's what turns the ministry music around. That's what turns the invitation around. You know, Jesus told them, he said, don't leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Now, what was that power going to do? Did it say anything in that power was going to do anything other than make you a witness? That's what it says. It says, and you will be witnesses. Now, without that Holy Spirit power, you're not going to be a witness. So we need the Holy Spirit working in our life so we can be, vi uh, we can be witnesses of Him. And also, when God does something in your life, it's contagious. People see that. It's contagious when God moves in your life. And, you know, and I'm not, you know, like I say, trust me, I'm not against getting everybody's opinion because there's some things around here we could probably change and make things better, no doubt about it. And, but, you know, if we can get a congregation of people here focused on Jesus, focused on worshiping Christ, becoming mature believers. I mean, we can have every program in the world. If we're not becoming mature believers, we spin in our wheels. Because there'll come a time, there'll come a day when you might get to the point to where things aren't working the way you think they ought to be working. Been there recently. I know what I'm talking about. God, I wouldn't do that to me. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You get that kind of opinion. But you've got to have enough in you to realize, enough in you to realize that not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And your will's to heal me. Your will's to fill me. Your will's to make me whole. And the day could be your day where that starts. Now, if anybody in here has already got all that working in their life to 100%, I want you to pray for me. Because I know I don't have it working in my life 100%, but Lord, I would, I would take it from anybody that, it, man, because I'm going to tell you what, when it comes down to it, I think we all got room to mature and to grow. If we all have room to make improvements in our discipline toward Jesus. Now, I'm not telling you to pray three times a day. I'm not telling you to do a certain way. And see, the way I pray and the way you pray may be two different things. And the way you study the Word and the way I study the Word is probably two different things. See, I study the Word by trying to find one verse or one promise that I can stand on. And I'll try to find that one verse. Now, they're not, they're not hard to find. I mean, you just find you a verse and pray it, stand on it, believe it. But always put your focus on Jesus. Put your focus on Him because He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that you know, we're, we're, what we're doing on earth today needs to be in His plan and we need to be doing what He's called us to do. You know, I'm not responsible for what the Lord called Sam to do. I'm not responsible for what the Lord called Dennis to do. I'm responsible for what He called me to do. And what's so sad is, if you go around and raise your hand, how many people think you know what God's called you to do? Half the people I talk to outside of the church will tell me they don't know what God got for them to do. They never have figured that out. And how sad is that to go through your life and not be figured out what God has called you to do? Now, we live in, a, we live in this world, and we, gotta, we have this flesh, and we have this, but just like the guy who Jesus made the mud and healed you know, they kicked him out of the church. He met Jesus. He got on fire for God. He got healed. He got touched, whatever. The church didn't want that. The Pharisees didn't want that. But then you got Jesus. You know, Jesus is the type that he never did really fit into their mold. But when I read Philippians 4, 19, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, see, I can read that verse... I can read that verse, and as I go through the day today, I can say, Lord, I just thank you that you supply all my needs. Lord, I praise you, and I thank you that you supply all my needs, not according to the job I have, but to his riches in, in glory by Christ Jesus. So I can get that, and I can pray that one verse, and I can believe that, and I can think about that through the day. 
And, and you know, but it's, it's, simple to, it's simple to find a verse. Now, I know I talked to a friend this past week that he read the whole Bible through cover to cover. And he told me how many hours it took him to do it. And that's great. That's, but I don't study that way. Which, you know, he said when he got to heaven, he didn't want God to say, did you read the book? And him say, no. He said, so I sat down, I read the whole book from front to back. I said, well, that's, that's one way to look at it. You don't want God to call you on it when you get to heaven. But, but you know, I study, like I find Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Y'all don't know how many times I laid in bed. I laid on the floor. I mean, I laid on the floor with a pillow that I was saying, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can get over this. I can get over this. God, you can heal me. God, you can touch me. And sometimes you just need that little word. You don't need the whole devotion that you might be praying. Sometimes you just need a, you just need a word from the Lord. But... I'm going to tell you, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That's Philippians 4. See, that's the way I get a scripture like that, and I just, I just keep rolling with it. And y'all don't know the times and the days that I laid there, and I would just take a scripture out of that little book we have, uh, that Charles Capps book about healing. I'd just take one little scripture. I'd read that scripture. I'd pray it over me. I'd speak it over me. Then I would get in this, can you supposed to say the word depression, Jerry? All right, I get in this depression where I get sorry for myself and I get to thinking stuff like, well, God, what is, what, what's wrong? Lord, I mean, I'm saying your word, I'm praying your word, I'm believing you, God. Why am I still hurting like I'm hurting? Why am I having the trouble I'm still having? And then you got a beautiful wife that looks at you and says, you got best friends that's dying of cancer. It kind of makes you feel sort of, you know, <laughs> okay, God, uh, maybe I've got this thing wrong. Instead of being in the depths of pity for myself, maybe I need to be praying for my friends that are dying of cancer. Because then I spent, then, oh, wait a minute. Then it, th I'm telling y'all something that I learned the hard way. You, you just listen to me. Then I went in and barely said, you start thanking him for it. I said, oh, wait a minute. I've been laying around here in the, in the dumps. I got to the point to where I thought about hurting myself. Now I'm telling you, that's not God. That's not God. I know it's not. But then I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Beverly would lay and pray over me, and she'd say, just thank you, God, that, that you're going to heal him. Thank you, God, you've already healed him. I just started thanking him. I just started thanking him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And, and, and he revealed something else to me. The Bible talks about praying to the Father through Jesus' name. So I started saying, Father, I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name for touching me. I thank you, Father, for touching Barry. I thank you, Father, for touching Kim. I started going through these people I know that have terminal cancer and stuff, and I started praying for them. Now, that's one thing I have to say about the faith message that we've heard. If you're going through something, you were taught that you've done something wrong. What have you done wrong? Where have you missed God? I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Sometimes bad things just happen to good people for no reason. I don't believe that. And then you, then you start asking yourself questions like, well, Lord, we're praying for them, but like my dad, he was 62 years old. Believe God was going to heal him right up to the point where he passed away. He said, God, now, we were praying healing over him. We were laying hands on him. I can name you another person who they had a 24-hour visual for him. There was somebody praying in his bedside 24 hours a day Seven days a week, he died of cancer. He went on to be with the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's no reason to pray because I believe praying is important. I believe praying is what got me through the hardship that I went through. It was God, Jesus, and praying is what got me through it. But whatever you do, whatever you take from this message today, just take this. Whatever you do, don't focus on the flesh don't focus on this side. Put your focus on Him who's in heaven. Alright, if you've been planted to this church, if God's planted you in this church, and you feel like this is where God has planted me, you need to get on fire for God. You need to find out what your purpose is. You need to find out what God's called you to do. And you need to apply your hand to that to be the best you can be at whatever it might be. Now, some people say, well, I think God's called me to that church just to grow. You know what? I don't have a problem with that. Because a lot of us really need to grow up before we ever get into ministry. And I tell you what, if you haven't grown up and you get into ministry, by the time you think you're getting started good, you'll get kicked in the teeth by somebody in their attitude. Because I'm telling you, you've got to have this attitude of, well, I'm doing His will. They don't like me, so what? 
You know what I mean? You've got to get that attitude sometimes. But always remember to put your focus on Him. Focus on Jesus because He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Don't let, don't let circumstances of this life get you into believing that God don't love you, that God has somehow done this to you. Because I don't believe God works that way. You know, I have people tell me, you know, well, you know how it is when you're going through something, you know, God's trying to teach you a lesson. I said, Lord, have mercy. If you're trying to teach me a lesson, Lord, send me a book. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's a lesson. You know, that's a lesson we don't want to learn. But, you know, trials and tribulation, it does do something to your faith. But you can't focus on this flesh. You have to focus on Him. You have to focus on not allowing yourself to get to the point to where you blame God for what bad going on in your life. 99% of the bad stuff that's happened in my life I've done to myself. You don't blame God for everything you're going through. Don't, and, and, and asking why is like the worst thing you can do because He don't never tell you why. Beverly has an aunt that's 97 years old. She's in assisted living. We thought she'd die the day they put her in because she was so independent. She's been there five years. Them ladies say she's a comedian because she's always telling them something off the wall. But the thing about it, she's lasted over five years over there. We didn't think she'd last five minutes in assisted living. And, you know, we ask ourselves sometimes, God, what are you trying to teach us in this situation? Uh, you know, but guess what? Life and death is his. I mean, we can't control that. You know, and, and sometimes you see people around you going through things and the worst thing you can do is try to judge them and say, well, God, he must be putting something on them for something. Because Jesus didn't walk that way. Jesus didn't live that way. In the Old Testament, I know God's God. He never changes. But when Jesus showed up on the scene, he changed things. Yeah. Jesus said, they said, we, can't, we don't know about him. The church said, we don't know about him because he's a friend of sinners. Wait a minute. You mean he, he's a friend of sinners? Yeah, he was a friend of sinners. He, you know... God never asked us to judge. You know, I seen a t-shirt one time, and I'm about to quit. I seen a t-shirt one time that said, kill them all, let God sort them out. And it was, a, it was some, some military group, you know. Kill them all, let God sort them out. Well, this is, this is mine for you today. Love them all, let Christ sort them out. Love them all and let Jesus sort them out. Because you can't fix them no way. You can't fix me even if you try. You can't fix a person in this room even if you try. The Holy Spirit and Jesus is the only one that can fix them. So love them all and let God sort them out. Amen? Because, you know, this idea of I'm so righteous and you're so unworthy... That's what Jesus cursed. He, he cursed the Pharisees for that. So, love them all and let God sort them out. Let Christ sort them out. And not only that, if there's anybody here today, now, you might not be to where I was talking about I was at, where I couldn't even pray, but if there's anybody here this morning that needs somebody to pray with them about something, we have elders here, we have other people like Cindy and different people that have been taught in praying for people. And I know we're going to have this little renewed vows here in a minute, but let's take a minute. And if there's somebody needs prayer for something, just come forward. Jerry, you come forward for your sister. We're going to anoint you with oil for Claudette. But if you need God to touch you in some way, come forward before we stop and let's pray for you. Now, I know that Everybody here is probably going through something, but if you need God to touch you in some way, just come forward and we're going to pray for you. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, our website. Our Lord is building his kingdom. Join us in helping our Lord harvesting souls for his kingdom. Thank you for watching Christ the King Church, Shelby, North Carolina's Healing Center. Visit our website, www. ChristTheKingShelby.org and check us out on Facebook and YouTube.